I was 11 years old when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And of course, it was a horrible thing to happen. But, it, but the American people, even uh, uh, folks my age, were not unaware of what was going on in the world. And that ultimately, that we would probably be drawn into the war, but we all thought it would be in Europe, uh, not necessarily uh, in the Pacific. However, that was not a foreign idea as well. But it was a Sunday afternoon, and my family and I had been to church, and we uh, lived in the city. And as we were prone to do after Sunday uh, dinner, we called it at noon, we would uh, go out in the yard, and it was, a, it was a sunny, nice December day. And so the kids in the neighborhood, along with several adults, were out in the street passing a football back and forth. And uh, my mom came out of the house and said, uh, said to my dad, says, come in the house, you need to listen to the radio. And he said, what's wrong? She said, the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. And an ordinarily joyful crowd, slow silence suddenly came over the whole street. And everyone retreated to their living room to listen to the radio. And uh, I remember, quite honestly, the feelings of 11-year-old. I knew, I knew what it meant. And I knew that it was war. And the first thing that I thought about was my dad. And uh, I asked him, Dad, do you think you'll have to go to war? Well, my dad was 10 years older than my mom. So uh, he was uh, over, he was, I guess, 38 years old, had two children. And he said no. And there'd been enough talk about the draft to know uh, who would have to and who wouldn't. He says, I don't think that I'll have to go. And then immediately I thought about cousins and, and uh, uncles and uh, neighbors, uh, many of whom did finally go to war. But uh, teenage, well, I wasn't a teenager then, but before the war was over, I was. And it affected the lives of those who stayed at home, nothing like those who made the sacrifices and many of the supreme sacrifices on the battlefields around the world. But our life was different than it would have been ordinarily. And of course, being born in the Depression, we were already used to doing without a lot of things. And so in many ways, it was a continuation. Uh, we didn't have certain things because we couldn't afford it during the Depression years. Uh, we can have some of those certain things again uh, because of the scarcity of things. And one of the things, of course, that I remember is the rationing of everything. Food, especially meats, sugar, hard to get things, uh, shoes, tires, gasoline. <clears throat> uh, those things were just in short supply. I never once heard anyone complain. They would comment, well, we can't have the coconut cake because we don't have the sugar. But no one really complained about not having that coconut cake or not being able to go on a trip because the tires were bald or the gasoline was not available. And it was probably, and I, I think I have recollections of, <clears throat> of the zeitgeist of the day of being one of cohesiveness during the Depression. Well, that just continued because everybody was in the same boat. That continued on over into the World War II years. Uh, there was a cohesiveness, a, a sense of patriotism that uh, was just normal, natural. It didn't occur to us to be, be otherwise. Children didn't have toys in the Depression because you couldn't afford them. We didn't have toys <laughs> during World War II because the materials to make the toys were scarce. And it was before the days of plastic, so most toys were, were metal, and we didn't have the simple toys that, uh, that children had uh, would eventually have. But we didn't complain. We made our own toys. And uh, we would make uh, wooden guns. And uh, you could actually buy wood wooden guns. And we would play with those that shot rubber bands and, and uh, so forth. But anyway, it was, it, was, it was fun. But yet there was always a pall of uh, seriousness over, over the whole community. And I know that children were enlisted in the war effort through scrap drives. And my schoolyard, grammar school schoolyard, 
uh, had a big pile of tin cans. And I'm talking about more than head high covering oh, uh, a number of square feet that people would bring tin cans to be recycled in, for the war effort. And the war effort was a term that you heard daily on many, on many occasions. But we also collected uh, old tires, <clears throat> collected all kinds of old motors or anything made of metal. One particular uh, metal that was scarce was aluminum. And people actually took pots and pans off of their cooking stove to give to the war effort. And, that, and the, I don't know who organized it, but there was a little organization called the Junior Commandos. And uh, they would weigh in your scrap metal uh, once a week. You would bring it. They would weigh it in. You would be awarded rank based on... Uh, based on the uh, amount of scrap metal that you had accumulated over a period of weeks and months. And uh, if you were a private, you got some kind of armband, as I recall, but it went on up to, if you got up into the field officer grade of colonel, you would get a, uh, uh, some sort of t-shirt uh, or, or sweatshirt, and then at some grades you, you got a hat, a military-type cap. And uh, I remember being a little envious of the one girl in my grade that became the top-ranking junior commando in our school. I later found out her dad was in the, a business that had a lot of scrap metal. <laughs> so I determined, well, if I couldn't be a rank, my little sister would. So I would go out and collect scrap metal and tin cans from home and take them in and turn them in in my sister's name. So I think she finally did get a sweatshirt, but I don't, she was a captain or maybe a lieutenant or something like that. But it was something that we took very seriously. Uh, our mothers would save grease from the uh, cooking and pour it in a can and turn that in, and that was used some sort of explosive uh, basic material. Gas, you couldn't go anywhere. You had, of course, gas was only like 18 cents a gallon, but uh, you only got four or five gallons a week, so you didn't go too far uh, on that unless you had uh, special jobs that a uh, doctor, for instance, would get more. And uh, each, and you had ration stamps for food and meat and gas and shoes uh, and tires. And uh, you could only buy a pair of shoes if you had the appropriate ration stamps to go buy the shoes. But at any rate, no one complained. It was, uh, it was uh, a time in which everybody felt akin. But it was a sad time, too, because I had several uncles, some cousins, and uh, uh, other folks in the family, and certainly a number of neighbors who had to go off to battle. And I, I would write, there were three or four that I would write letters to. And I'm sure they got a little chuckle out of my 12, 11 and 12 year old letters, but they would always write back. And as a result, I, I collected several souvenirs from the war that they brought back to me when, when, they, when they did come. But, uh, and I can remember uh, families when, uh, when uh, an uncle would write a letter back home to one of my aunts. We would all collect at my grandmother's house to, to hear the latest, to hear the letter. And they would read the letter maybe several times. But once again, I can't overemphasize the fact of the cohesiveness and the camaraderie of those of us who, who were at home and the tremendous support that we did everything we could, adults and children alike, to support the war effort and therefore our family members and, and friends and neighbors who, who were there fighting the war. Saddest thing for me that happened was uh, I was 12 years old, maybe, maybe 13, when uh, word came to the neighbor across the street that uh, the wife of the husband of their daughter had been killed in an airplane crash. And the daughter had come back to live with the parents uh, because, and that happened in a lot of cases, where the wives would go live with their parents or their husband's parents. And so she lived there and with the parents, and they had also had a son who was just a year or two older than I. 
and the lady came out from across the street screaming. And, uh, and of course, we all ran out, my mom and sister and I ran out to see what was, was happening. And she said, he's been killed, he's been killed. And we knew exactly what the situation was. Well, she had sent my contemporary, Jack, to the grocery store a couple blocks away to pick up a loaf of bread and some things. And she said, John, John, go get Jack, go get Jack. I hopped on my bicycle. She said, but don't tell him what's wrong. Bring him home, but don't tell him what's wrong. So I hopped on my bicycle and I rode to two or three blocks and uh, Jack was still in the store. I said, Jack, come with me, your mother wants you. And obviously he asked me, what's wrong, what's wrong? And I said, uh, just come with me. Your mother wants you. There's something wrong with mom, he would say. Something wrong with mom. And, and I wanted to keep my word. And I would say, uh, your mom just wants me, wanted me to bring you home. And so before we got to his house, he hopped on the back of my bike, as we were wont to do in those cases, riding to the bicycle. And before we got to his house, he had figured it out that his brother-in-law had been, had been killed in the war. And uh, that was the hardest errand I had to run during, during, during World War II. But uh, in school, uh, of course, we were always conscious of the war effort. And uh, in fact, I had a world map on my uh, bedroom wall in which I had little pins with flags on them that I would follow on a uh, day-to-day -day or almost a day-to-day -day basis. The advancement of our troops, and I had it separated, the English and the French and the, and the Americans, and I didn't worry too much with the Russian front. But uh, I would follow the war, and I was maybe a little more conscious than some, but we were all very aware, and I had school friends whose uh, parents or fathers were in the, in the war. And uh, we always sort of deferred to them. We gave them a little extra room when it came to uh, schoolyard teasing and that sort of thing because we, we, we felt their pain in a way, although we could never honestly feel the, the loss or the absence of a father as, as they did. But of course we had air raid, air raid drills in school. The windows were taped up and uh, in case of an of a air raid attack, and uh, we would all, they would have air raid drills and we would all collect in the uh, hallways. And uh, we would sit on the floor lined across, uh, along the walls. And uh, that was a sobering moment for a 12 year old uh, to practice what you would do. And of course, we didn't have television, but we certainly had radio and the newsreels to show us what was going on in, in, in Europe, especially in the Blitz with pictures in, uh, in, in England. And then at home we would have uh, air raid drills at night in which everybody was to turn out their lights, pull the shades, and each block or two had an air raid cap, uh, air raid warden they were called. My wife's dad was an air raid warden. And they all took their job very seriously. They wore English type helmet and, and an armband and they would patrol the streets. And if they saw a speck of light coming through a window, they would, they would come and uh, knock on the door and, and tell you to extinguish that light. I never knew of anybody getting thrown in jail or anything for a light showing, but everyone was very conscious, conscientious about it. And we all followed the news. We'd go to uh, movies changed three times a week, and uh, admission was nine cents for kids. So we, we usually went to the movies about three three times a week and of course the movie tone newsreel would keep us abreast of, uh, of what was happening on the war front and obviously they'd be several days late but, but we kept up with it visually uh, through the uh, newsreels. And uh, even patriotism extended over into the movie th uh, audience because when an American flag would come on we would clap and cheer and whistle and then if a picture was Hitler was coming on, we would, uh, we would boo and hiss and, and or, or the enemies. And uh, it was just the whole idea of patriotism just uh, permeated the whole, the whole scene every moment of every day. D-Day finally came and that was when we knew that, 
that although the, the uh, battle was not nearly over, that it was the beginning of a major uh, 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 invasion. And everybody from Hitler on down to my schoolmates knew that the invasion was coming. Nobody knew when or where. And so it happened on, in June of, uh, uh, of uh, June the 7th. And uh, school was out, and we were in vacation Bible school. And, of course, it happened during our night, uh, but several hours before. And our uh, vacation Bible school teachers at the church uh, uh, learned of it. And uh, they got up at 4.30 in the morning and started preparing a special program for that morning's opening and assembly. And uh, I'll never forget that that ceremony with the flags and the patriotic songs and, and uh, the rejoicing that, that we were on that course, but the sober realization was that much, much more blood was to be shed. And ultimately, the end of the war came, and by then I was, what, 15, 15 years old. And uh, everybody collected into downtown, and uh, the streets were just mobbed, and uh, people were blowing horns, and I had an old plastic Boy Scout bugle. Couldn't get a metal one, so I had one Christmas I'd gotten a plastic Boy Scout bugle, and uh, my cousin and my dad and uncle and I went downtown and uh, I was blowing that bugle to the top of my lungs capacity and that went on into the night although I had to, I had to leave early uh, understand that the celebration actually lasted all, all night long. And uh, we actually had two victory days. One was the victory in Europe and there was celebration going on then. Uh, as well, but a few months later, VJ Day it was called in August, I think. That was the that was the big that was the big celebration, and nobody during that time had an extra pair of shoes. Nobody got a new car. Nobody got a new uh, appliance. And uh, when the war was over, all of the energy that had been placed into building munitions suddenly turned to consumer products. And uh, what people had never thought about having a washing machine, of course, I had a washing machine. People wanted a new car. We had an old 1936 Chevrolet that we drove until 1947 when we were first able to get a, a new Chevrolet, and which was the pride and joy of our, our family. And uh, consumerism really, really took off. And I don't know what happened, but during the 50s, I called the happy years, uh, happy days. Uh, attitudes started shifting some, and uh, we became uh, more introverted, uh, less patriotic, less concerned, in my opinion, and I think some of that has deteriorated through the years. At, at the end of VE Day, Yes, a few people did come back. A few veterans did come back, but by and large, they were reassigned to the Pacific. And I, uh, I had an uncle who had been in Europe, and he was reassigned to the Pacific. But by then, the Japanese were on the run, and the end was fairly well in sight, uh, except for the invasion of Japan itself. That was a great unknown. And... Uh, uh, I, I found no depletion of patriotism or will to fight, none whatsoever. Uh, after VE Day, I found a great deal of relief. But uh, then when uh, VJ, VJ Day came, as was precipitated because of, uh, uh, because of the, uh, Harry, President Truman's decision to drop the A-bomb, I, I heard of no remorse whatsoever. That was the thing to do. It saved hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives that would have been lost had we had to invade Jap the, uh, Japan because the Japanese were determined to fight to the last breath. And so only in, in subsequent years did this whole idea of the collateral damage of uh, the atomic bomb come into play. But as some of our veterans have said, war's hell. People die, the innocent and, uh, and the uh, uh, just alike. 
That's, that's what war is, and that's why it is so terrible. But collateral damage is, a, is an integral part of warfare. The development of the atomic bomb was super, super secret. There were always rumors, uh, you know, that uh, this weapon or that weapon was being developed. And the truth is, they were, there were uh, developments going on all of the time. But when the uh, atomic bomb was dropped over Japan, uh, we had no concept of what they were talking about. They were talking about splitting the atom. Most people never heard of an atom, much less splitting one. <laughs> and uh, we had no concept whatsoever of how it worked. But when we saw the pictures of the devastation and the expansiveness of the mushroom cloud and the, and the wholesale destruction, <clears throat> we did indeed have some second thoughts about whether this could be the, uh, end of the end of the world as we knew it because of subsequent developments. Because when they exploded the first, elect the first uh, atomic bomb, they didn't know what was going to happen. It was a chain reaction, and they, they didn't, weren't sure whether that chain reaction would continue to everything in the world. So there was indeed concern over it, but not, the, not generally the kind of concern that we, we have today. Our attitude towards Germans and the Japanese and the Italians, uh, who were our principal enemies, I, don't, I can't say anything other than we hated them. And uh, we, we saw what they were doing. We saw that the war they started. They saw the, the treachery, the brutality, and we hated them. And uh, we, had no, we had no sympathy for them at all. Now, perhaps we should be ashamed of it, but that, that hatred spread over the whole race. The whole, all, of, all Germans, all Italians, and all Japanese. But an interesting thing, uh, we hated the Japanese more than we did the Germans, and the Germans more than we did the Italians. And a lot of that had to do with our heritage, because we didn't put Germans in concentration camps like we did the Japanese. If we did, we'd have had to put a full 35% of the population uh, uh, of German descent. So the Japanese, had the reputation of being more ruthless, more inhuman, and in many, many ways they certainly were. And so the Japanese was enemy, Japanese were enemy number one, Germans next, and Italians third in line. Kids played war. Uh, before World War II, we played cowboys and Indians a lot. But after World War II started, Kids played war, and uh, we would make believe uh, that we would have battles, that people on, lived on one side of the street would battle people in an imaginary war. We dug foxholes. We even uh, formed little uh, groups that would look for enemy airplanes, <laughs> and uh, we learned to identify. We, any kid anywhere I knew could identify all military aircraft. Uh, American aircraft because we didn't see any other kind. But we would look up, we'd know immediately that was a B-24, that was a uh, A-20 or what. As a matter of fact, on Easter Monday when I was 12 years old, there was an A-20 light bomber, a uh, two-engine light bomber coming back to an uh, airfield that was 10, 15 miles from my house. I was sitting on the front porch, and I heard this roar, and I, and I looked down the street, and three houses down I saw a motor, uh, a burning motor fall through the front porch of my neighbor's house. And then that threw the plane off balance, and it cartwheeled into a field in front of my house. And uh, I was on the front porch, and uh, my sister was inside, and she came running out, and I said, get back, get back, get back, because of a giant ball of fire. And I can, to this day, I can feel the, that heat on my face. 
And, uh, and to this day, I can smell burning human flesh in my mind. And of course, they closed down the neighborhood in a hurry and the military police were on, on the site. Oh, it seemed to me like instantaneously. My mom had gone to pick up my dad at work and they were coming back and they, they saw it from the other side and they knew it had to be near our house. And so uh, my, and they, were, they were beside themselves that there two, that my, my I and my sister were there by ourselves. And so by then they had uh, hose, fire hose spread across the road and they were blocking the road and policeman told my dad, says, you can't go in there. My dad says, "You watch me," and he bumped over the hoses and came, and didn't didn't stop for a second until they got to our house and had my sister and me collected in their arms in the in the front yard. Oh, there were no bombs on board, but there were a lot of machine gun bullets, and uh, they were popping like crazy uh, in the fire that ensued. I was born in, and and spent my early years in Charlotte. And that's where I was during World War II. My dad was from Abbeville County, and he had come to town. To, he had moved to Charlotte uh, because he was tired of farming, and he said he wasn't going to ever tell another mule to get up if he sat on his lap. And so he, he, he went to uh, Charlotte and uh, met my mom there, and they ultimately were married. And, and settled, and they stayed in Charlotte the rest of their life. My dad was uh, Jesse Brock. My mom was Louise Honeycutt Brock, and my sister Mary Louise, but when they brought her home from the hospital, nobody believes this, but I was 21 months old when they brought her home from the hospital, and I can remember it. I honestly have a vivid memory. And I said, she looks just like a dolly. And I mean, you know, I wasn't used to seeing babies, so she she was hung with that nickname the rest of her <laughs> rest of her life, and family still calls her Dolly, but her name is Mary Louise. My name is John Otto Brock. I tell people I have a middle name. You can spell frontwards or backwards, uh, sideways. Uh, it's uh, inside out is toot, and sideways is toto. So, my mom was a, <laughs> she was a feminist long before feminism became popular, but it didn't involve burning underwear or anything like that. She went to work uh, before I was born in a medical library in, uh, that, the, that the physicians kept and used. And then after I was born, uh, she stayed at home with me and uh, well, actually, she stayed home until after my sister was born, 21 months later. And uh, then she worked in a doctor's office. And uh, but then she went to work, work with the with the medical uh, region, what became a regional medical center, and she worked there for many years. But uh, when computers came in, my mom was already getting about 50 years old, I guess, or older, probably older. And all the people were all torn up about having to learn how to use computers. Well, my mom picked it up about after about two hours of instruction and led the young folks through the adaptation of the computer age. <laughs> we uh, didn't have much entertainment, uh, movies. That was about it. And, uh, of course, we'd have family get-togethers and picnics and church groups and, and a lot a lot of that. One of the things that we did for entertainment that my mother saw to that I don't think all kids my age enjoyed, but we made a, she saw it to it, to it that we made a weekly trip to the library. And uh, we would check out as many books as they would allow, come home, read those books during that week, go back the next week and get another load. And I've always been appreciative of my mama's efforts to uh, open up those doors for my sister and me, a uh, practice that we still, that we both still enjoy.
during an air raid, you didn't drive an automobile at night. You pulled over and, uh, and parked till the air raid was over. We had sirens that would let you know when one started and when one ended. Now, emergency vehicles did drive uh, unless they knew that it was an actual uh, air raid. But then they, most of them, though, had the top half of their headlights taped over so that you just got partial light from, from underneath. Holidays during the war were relatively unaffected. Uh, Christmas, of course, you didn't have the variety of gifts, but nobody really worried about that either. All kids had a little Santa Claus, but they were different kinds of toys than they would enjoy uh, later because of the scarcity of some materials. Uh, the other holidays were pretty much the same, except there was always a pall of, of, of a certain amount of sadness uh, in our consciousness of those loved ones who were not with us at that time. Uh, electricity was uh, very, very much available, so we didn't worry about saving on Christmas lights, uh, electricity, and that sort of thing. Or, and we didn't have Halloween lights. The only time you ever used lights was, was at Christmas time. The main problem was, was getting replacement bulbs. Uh, you couldn't do that. So you didn't, you didn't run your Christmas tree lights 24-7 like we do today. You turn them on a little while in the evening, you know, and enjoy them and then turn them back off. That was not to save electricity, however. That was to save the light bulbs. The availability of food uh, during World War II. We didn't go hungry in America. We ate differently than we would have. Meat was scarce, but we had plenty of vegetables. And then there was the business of the Victory Garden. I don't know a house on the street where I lived that didn't have a Victory Garden. Uh, we had some pl uh, room in the backyard. We had a nice Victory Garden and raised enough stuff to eat all summer on and then have my mother would can all all summer for the winter use, and so we never went, we never went hungry. We may not have had to eat exactly what we would have chosen otherwise. Several of the people who had shady backyards on my street that couldn't have a victory garden in the backyard, they dug up their front lawn, and it was not unusual at all to see a victory garden uh, in front of a house rather than behind one. Uh, people raised chickens in town. And of course, they always did in the in the summer, and then I I mean in the, <laughs> they always raised chickens in the country, but uh, even in town, uh, we never did have any. But our neighbors on both sides had chickens, and we'd help feed them, and and uh, we would enjoy the harvest of the chickens when the time came. Had uh, all my kin folks lived in the country, and and Daddy would buy a hog and pay half the food for the hog, and uh, uh, my uncles would kill and slaughter the hog and prepare it, and we'd get half and they'd get half. So we always had a ham and a sausage hanging in the, in the attic or in the garage. And speaking of attic, uh, on the weekends during World War II, soldiers would come in from outlying camps into town for the weekend. There was one or two hotels in town, but downtown was a USO office that they would report to. And my mom and dad, like many other couples in town, would go down and pick up servicemen on Friday or Saturday night, bring them back to the house, feed them, and give them a place to stay. And my dad had gotten two, bit, two double beds and moved them into the attic. And my mother and dad uh, and my sister and I would sleep in those two beds in the attic and turn our three bedrooms downstairs uh, below the attic over to servicemen and uh, who were always very, very appreciative. And for years and years and years, my, my mom and dad would get Christmas cards and and other letters from some of the guys who had, who had stayed with us on their weekend in town. Mom would always try to give them a, 
a mom home cooked meal, and uh, she would gladly use up some of her ration stamps to uh, uh, to entertain the soldiers. I mean, everybody was that way. It wasn't just my family, but nobody could do enough for our servicemen. And uh, they were honored guests in our town and in our home and in our churches. And uh, it, was just, it was just the way we felt, <laughs> what, we, what we wanted to do. And uh, during the war, during the war, I decided to be an entrepreneur. The uh, meat was scarce, but uh, uh, mostly that was, uh, was red meat. Generally speaking, everybody had plenty of poultry. But, uh, and then folks in the country, they would rabbit hunt and have plenty of rabbits. But people in town uh, didn't get rabbit meat. And uh, believe it or not, that was a, a staple in the South, was rabbit meat. And so I started raising rabbits. And that was easy to do because you could raise a lot in a short period of time. And so I would butcher the rabbits in my backyard, uh, skin them and prepare them, and take them down to the A&P and sell them to the A&P for 50 cents a piece. And they would put it on. They would put it in their meat counter, just like the today's USDA approved meat. And if I tried to sell rabbits to a chain store today, they'd put us both in jail. But I opened my very first bank account when I was 13 years old with the proceeds from my rabbits. When the troops started returning home, it was a joyful occasion. Now, obviously, they didn't all come home at the same time. The ones who'd been in the longest and who had gotten so many points and from various degrees of combat and flight missions, they they came and the wounded. They came home first, so it happened over a period of time, uh, and some people were they were even a year or two coming home for good, and uh, but they were they were fully embraced back into society, and uh, most of them got the jobs back if they wanted those jobs. Uh, a lot of the women who had fi uh, filled those jobs during the war decided to go back to the home and that opened up those, those jobs. And uh, uh, it was a, a fairly easy transition and uh, it was a very pleasant, happy, happy time. Now some of them, uh, you know, some of veterans had quit high school and joined and in my high school, I had several returning veterans while in my class came back to finish up their, their high school education. And then when I went to college, uh, there were many, many veterans going to work on the, uh, uh, going to school on the GI Bill. Anybody, anybody that came back from service with an injury was treated with great respect and deference and they were embraced. Now, fortunately, uh, no one among my close family or friends uh, had any enduring uh, maiming pain, uh, uh, maiming uh, injuries, uh, but they certainly were, and these folks were, were, honored, were honored for their service. For some reason, after World War II, we didn't have the open display of post-traumatic syndrome. There were people that we heard were shell-shocked, is what they called it, and it was, it, it was a real thing. I mean, these people suffered some psycho psychological damage from being shell-shocked. And there was some residual of this among the returning veterans groups, but not much was overt. And, uh, and nothing like what developed in Vietnam and subsequently. And uh, I, well, I don't know. I've often wondered what the explanation of that was. Uh, did people just hide it after World War II? Did they just tough it out? Did they just keep it suppressed? I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know this, that there are veterans, World War II veterans alive today who will not talk about their experiences. And I had relatives and friends 
uh, family friends who never discussed the horrors of what they'd gone through. And that was always respected. You always gave the veteran the benefit of the doubt or the privilege of talking or not talking. You never pressed, you never pushed. And there were children who grew up, whose daddies died in old age and who never knew the experiences of their own father. When I was growing up, neighborhoods were tight-knit, uh, very close. And uh, my mama would not hesitate for a moment correcting or disciplining a kid from across the street or down the street, nor would those mamas hesitate and discipline me. It was really one big family. And uh, in the South, especially, uh, communities were, were close, close-knit. And uh, it didn't make any difference whether you were kin or not. Now, uh, Wilbur J. Cash, in his book that he published in 1939-40, The Mind of the South, he made the statement that every Southerner was kin to every other Southerner within a 30-mile radius. And I think for that day and age, that was pretty darn nearly true. But World War II, interstate highways, and a national notion of moving south has uh, really stirred that up. And I don't know that that's true in all areas of the South today. But in the less sparsely populated areas, uh, kinship is a proud thing and, and something adhered to quite closely and has always been a, a Southern tradition. Uh, life changed after World War II. The suburbs uh, started growing around the cities, grew on out into uh, the rural communities, and uh, I don't know, growth became sort of a goal for the sake of growth. And I never have understood all of the rationale about bigger being better. And uh, my hometown was a better place 50 years ago when I was growing up or more than, than I think it is today. And I think that can be said of a lot of communities. The war was over. Uh, in 40, 45, and uh, I didn't graduate my school until five years later. And in 1950, I graduated just in, from high school, just in time for the start of the Korean War within less than 30 days. And uh, I remember being concerned about what, you know, when am I, I mean, it wasn't any question about it me going to serve, we still had to draft then. It was just a matter of, you know, when will my turn, when will my turn come? And so reluctantly then, I started college in the fall of 1950. And uh, they were drafting people right and left. And then they offered uh, college deferments. As long as you kept your grades up to a certain level, you could be deferred, not excused, just postpone your drafting. And uh, maybe that was some incentive to make some grades, but uh, I was deferred until uh, right at the end of the Korean War. As a matter of fact, hostilities, well, they stopped shooting at each other for the most part, but the armistice hadn't been signed when I volunteered for the draft then and went on, in, went on into the United States Army.